There we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first Choosing Our Climate Legacy Priorities for a More Equitable and Resilient Ohio webinar. This series aims to discuss the future climate resiliency in Central Ohio. Today's guest, Dr. Jesse M. Keenan, will be speaking on market-based climate adaptation in the built environment. My name is Jerica Logan. I am the Outreach Coordinator at the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis, otherwise known as CURA. I will be your host for this event. If you require closed captioning, you will find a box at the bottom of the screen called CC. Click the box and select show subtitles. This will allow you to see, see the subtitles during the presentation. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar in the Q&A box. We will ask as many of your questions as we can in the last portion of the presentation. And if we do not get to your question, we apologize. If you have any additional questions following this event, please feel free to email me at logan.433 at osu.edu. There will be a short survey at the end of the webinar. If you have any time, please provide your feedback. I am now going to pass it over to our director, Harvey Miller. Okay, everyone, thank you, uh, Jerrica, and welcome to today's seminar. This seminar is part of CURA's regular series on issues and challenges facing the cities and regions in Ohio and beyond. Other events this semester in our Choosing Our Climate Legacy webinar series is March 4th, Vivek Shandis, the founder, founder and director of the Sustainable, Sustaining Urban Places Research Initiative at Portland State University. On March 25th, we'll welcome Robin Lachenko, Professor of Geography at Rutgers University. And then to close off this series, on April 29th, we're going to have a panel of the movers and shakers locally looking at these issues of climate resilience in Central Ohio. That panel will feature Lena Irwin from the OSU, OSU Sustainability Institute, Aaron Beck from the Department of Public Utilities at the City of Columbus, Kirsten Carr from the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, and Sandy Doyle Ahern from EMH and T Incorporated. So please visit cura.osu.edu slash events to learn about this and other future events. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at cura.osu.edu. That way you'll never miss any uh, reminders of events or any of the exciting things happening constantly at Cura. You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and I don't think we're on TikTok quite yet, but stay tuned. So my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jesse Keenan. He is an associate professor and social scientist within the faculty of the School of Architecture at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. He is a globally recognized thought leader. His research focuses on the intersection of climate change adaptation and the built environment, including aspects of design, engineering, regulation, planning, and financing. Keenan holds concurrent appointments as a member of the U.S. delegation to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and as an appointed member of the U.S. Global, Ch Global Change Research Program for the Fifth National Climate Assessment. Keenan's research has partnered partner with a variety of global actors, and just to name a few, uh, the Carnegie Corporation, the EPA, Goldman Sachs, Google, Knight Foundation, NASA, National Security Council, National Science Foundation, the Rand Corporation, the White House, and the UN. Again, I'm, I'm actually leaving a, quite a few off that list. His, book, his books include Blue Dunes, Climate Change by Design from Columbia University Press, and Climate Change Adaptation in North America, Experiences, Case Studies, and Best Practices from Springer. Oh, and the third book, Climate Adaptation, Finance and Investment in California from Rutledge. Keenan holds degrees in law and science of the built environment and a PhD from the Delft University of Technology. And with that, I turn it over to you, Dr. Keenan. 
thank you so much for the opportunity to Cura and the, uh, the center and, and for having me and everyone at Ohio State for the um, really the invitation and the opportunity uh, to present um, a little bit of a thesis that I'll get into in the short amount of time today. And I'm really very much looking forward to some feedback and some questions uh, associated with that thesis, but really to reflect on the opportunities that are happening in the broader Columbus metropolitan region as well. Uh, today, market-based climate adaptation in the built environment. So here's the general thesis, and this is in the context of what we can understand as climate and migration or climate migration in America. My thesis is essentially this, that markets are in the process of revaluing a variety of different aspects. We're going to talk today in the context of the built environment of housing, real estate, infrastructure, insurance, muni bonds. There's declining property tax rolls and economic uh, output in particularly uh, high risk areas that will accelerate capital allocation decisions. Capital uh, will shift to lower risk geographies with superior amenities, things like uh, potable water or network connections to higher degree engineering resilience and supply chains, for instance. Migration should follow the spatial distribution of capital as it has for generations and really the history of modern economic geography in America. And markets will increasingly dictate the pathways, and this is the kicker, but markets themselves are dictating the terms, we can think of this in pathways or path dependencies of local adaptation uh, investments and options, really, I think by extension, challenging the democratic processes that we tend to think have some measure of agency about what to protect and what to let go. So if this were to be an accurate reflection of broader phenomenon and behavior, which it may or may not be, but there's certainly emerging evidence that this is the direction we're heading in, I'll talk about some of that evidence today relating to my own body of work. But if this were to accurate, what is our role in policy more generally as a matter of adaptation? Well, the first thing we want to do is not necessarily promote adaptation, but at least try to avoid maladaptation, and particularly by understanding the associated trade-offs, which are very, we tend, for instance, to talk about resilience as an absolute good. Well, it's not. There's a lot of different types of resilience. Primarily what we're talking about is engineering or disaster resilience. And there's many, many examples from which resilience may actually lead to maladaptation. In fact, this gets to the very notion of distributional equity uh, and as well as procedural justice. Uh, so it's a uh, moving beyond the rhetoric of resilience is one key element analytically to understanding those trade-offs. So when we think about the adjudication of efficient, effective, and ultimately just, and again, just uh, breaking or uh, thinking about equity in terms of distributional equity and procedural justice, we have to think about that in the context of public resources associated with adaptation. By extension, we could maybe even begin to think about the opportunity to break poverty traps and the allocation and the accessibility of capital. Uh, and in this concept of climate migration, we have to think about who's vulnerable and uh, who gets left behind and minimizing that uh, ultimately the social welfare declines uh, associated with that. And we ultimately have to think about investments in public good with a strategic acknowledgement of our resources, whether that's in infrastructure or service delivery or whatever it may be, on where to invest and where to disinvest strategically and understand how the markets are shaping our options are real options, by the way, and the extent to which we are engaged in that process. And we already, believe it or not, we already see this in the muni bond market. We see it with underwriting and municipal debt. We already see these machinations happening analytically, but also economically. And this leads us to the opportunity to plan for the future, not just for today, particularly with the long run allocation of assets. So I began my sort of journey. It's a story you could care less about, but one part of my body of work was really thinking about sea level rise and high risk coastal areas relating to real estate, having done in a professional context, develop real estate cities and infrastructure all around the world and started to see an association from which we now have some measure of attribution associated with climate impacts and extreme environmental exposure. And this idea that sea level rise and property value, the perception associated with shifting consumer demand was something that has uh, been at the forefront of my thinking for a number of different years. So the big picture, when you think about the built environment, you sort of ground this at a more localized sense, or maybe even a macro sense at the, at, at the same time, is there's risks and opportunities, right? So if, if economics are driving climate migration, driving the, uh, um, the allocation, I, I should say markets, not economics, or driving the allocation of capital, people follow behind. What's the big picture here? Well, the big picture is risks and opportunities. The risks are devalued assets, declining property tax rolls, uninsured losses, loss of income, NOI. 
and regional declines in economic output. Um, and that has implications, of course, for things like commercial real estate and demand for industrial and all of these other sectoral and programmatic aspects of the old environment. So these risks are intuitive. They're physical risks, and there's also some transition risks. But there's opportunities as well. And there's a huge world now of information arbitrage. Some of you may or may not have read my work on the climate intelligence arms race. But that is a phenomenon from which there is arbitrage of information uh, in gaming of essentially the management of uncertainties in the allocation of capital. Uh, and that is an opportunistic strategy for many. And in fact, everything that I'm talking about today is positioned within a number of different strategies of uh, funds, uh, private equity in particular in the United States and overseas. So people are realizing this. This isn't, isn't some strange academic formulation. This is actually a reflection of concurrent observations and thinking projections as well as investment strategies. And ultimately people will be on the move and they're gonna need more real estate. They're gonna need more stuff. And my argument has been, well, this is an opportunity ultimately for sustainable urban development, not to recreate sprawl, but to really think about our obligations for climate mitigation and sustainability, accessibility, affordability, and all of those other values that we impute into the design, construction, management of the built environment. But the reality is that our jurisdictional sort of legalistic geography and geography of risk is dictating our options for us. This is the property, this is an actual overlay of lots in Alabama and coast Alabama on the Gulf Coast. And that's where I sort of began my early thinking, which led to a formulation of an idea about a decade ago of climate gentrification. And I want to bring this up because climate gentrification has a couple different pathways, but it's really at the end of the day speaking about a very localized change in consumer demand. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a demand driven idea. In classic model of gentrification, you have supply. There's, there's, this is a debatable point. It's widely debatable in sociology and geography and other places. But in general, there's supply and demand driven gentrification. Most classic models of gentrification are about change in supply. And a developer comes in, sees some amenities or uncaptured value, and they build something, and then people come in. That's a gross simplification, oversimplification, but that's the general gist. Climate gentrification is quite different. It's distinct. It's about changing consumer demand and preferences oriented to the perspective of somewhat deterministically environmental risk and exposure. There's three primary pathways. One's the superior investment pathway. People are essentially moving capital from high risk to low risk geographies. That can be done locally or even regionally. That is people are moving intra-county, which is much of the climate migration is anticipated to be in the next few decades as mostly intercounty, as many demographers would argue. But you could have this people moving from Miami Beach to mainland Miami. That could drive climate gentrification on the high ground, for instance. But it could also be people moving from Central Florida or South Florida, rather, to, in, leading to climate gentrification in Atlanta or Charlotte or other job bases. So it's a multi-scalar orientation. The other is the cost burden pathway, which is a kind of inverse gentrification where essentially only the wealthy can remain. Uh, by virtue of the increased costs associated with insurance, lost labor hours, sitting in flood prone traffic, you know, you name it. It's increased costs and really the only wealth you can afford to live there. And finally is the resilience investment pathway, a really prime example of maladaptation of a form or one application of resilience. And in this case, you take a high-risk geography and you invest money into adaptation and resilience, principally engineering and maybe even ecological resilience, but increases the level of performance an amenity valuation that leads to rent seeking and actually leads to increase in prices and rents because of that increase of performance and increase in amenities. And as was observed in Copenhagen, in my initial formulation of this a decade or so ago, was that you're actually operating to drive out the very people you're intending to protect. There's an allied, this is coming in an allied field or subfield of inquiry called green gentrification is where I'm sort of inspired by this. One, I observed it, but two, I started to realize that green gentrification has its own sort of interesting body of work. Nonetheless, empirically, we want to look at the association uh, between elevation, which is a proxy for risk, and uh, uh, underlying changes in value. Uh, and what we found uh, was essentially 
the highest coefficient for the relationship between value or rate of appreciation and elevation, again, as a proxy for value, elevation is not a perfect proxy because of managed water systems and things like that. It was actually along the coast, which was quite surprising to us, this is Miami-Dade County. And in part, what we came to realize and what economists came to theorize and have much more sophisticated methods and papers after us, was that a big part of this is perception and is often associated with uh, or correlate, highly correlated with education attainment levels, which reflect um, a certain awareness or cognizance of future discounting associated with future value of property, which ended up retroactively sort of aligning up with this, with essentially the wealth on the coast, higher education attainment, greater awareness. That was a surprise to us. But the real contribution of this paper more than anything was breaking up the, um, looking at the flows of, of rates of appreciation, this kind of flow of capital in many ways, and understanding, or in this case, breaking up properties into one meter cohorts. And we theorized that around the year 2000, which is about when uh, there's some measure of attribution science that says that climate change is really impacting, you know, two, 300 fold increase, or uh, percentage increase in, um, uh, nuisance flooding and actual flooding uh, it becomes real at that point about 20 years ago, you know, plus or minus a few years here or there. We theorized that the lowest elevation cohort would begin to underperform the rest of the cohort. And in fact, that's indeed what happened. You can see in this orange line, this is across all properties in Miami-Dade County, significant underperformance ultimately of those lowest elevation properties ostensibly um, uh, again, a proxy, not a perfect proxy for risk, but one that actually, I was reading some literature uh, just the other day, and in fact, <clears throat> elevation turns out to be a better proxy for risk um, than we realized uh, in Florida, and the market seemed to reflect that. So climate gentrification has sort of gone on to have its own sort of resonance in public policy, the city of Miami sort of formalizing some long-term policy and thinking as have many places around the world. It sort of spurred or it directly spurred our thinking about very localized notions of in, at the intersection of housing, community development, economic development, um, and infrastructure, ultimately, the sort of spatial planning dimensions. What would it mean to move people in a very high risk area? This is Miami, by the way, on the mainland. This is the Miami River, Alapata, which has a, a tremendous ex, uh, capacity for transit oriented development. There's a, a metro rail uh, subway that runs here. This is the airport to the left. And just thinking sort of in the economy of it all uh, and in the spatial planning and landscape design, all of those rich, the richness that goes into city planning and building and affordable housing and service delivery and, you know, all, all of it. How do you do this? What does that look like? What's the zoning? What's the public policy? Um, you know, these are not, this is not architecture, urban design. This is sort of volumetric extrusion to give you a sense of scale in many ways. But this is the challenge that we have around the country as people begin to move very often in this case locally about how do we think about these reshifting notions uh, and how do they align with land use planning, capital planning and the like. So there's a lot of emerging evidence about price effects of climate change. It's not all uniformly as robust as one might think it is. There's some counter evidence here and there, but we're getting a more clear story. When it comes to sea level rise and price effects, there's long been uh, risk and risk reduction capitalization observed in the housing markets, particularly coastal housing uh, markets, usually with a declining level of robustness relative to an extreme event. But in general, very impactful work by Bernstein et al. in 2019, that basically is saying that properties in a sea level rise zone up to about six feet sea level rise zone um, are basically traded at about a 7% or valued at a 7% discount relative to other similarly situated properties. This number actually goes <coughs> way up 12, 15, 20% in areas um, uh, that are in the one, two and three foot range for sea level rise, which again becomes uh, allied to other coastal non-attributed climate risks that uh, may or may not have anything to do with um, climate change. Um, so there's an environmental exposure element there that's hard to tease out. But you see stronger discounting behavior in multifamily assets. Um, and you see that price effects are not just homes that are directly affected by flooding or inundation levels, um, but also are dependent, for instance, on roads and other infrastructural networks that themselves are at risk from flooding. So that's having impact 
uh, and that's something we anticipated actually in our in our work early on. Uh, geographic concept. So that's a, the kind of a primary level. At the capital markets level, we see things like geographic concentration of risk premiums now in the mortgage markets and the secondary markets. So there's there's evidence sliced all the way through, and from the you know primary discounting at the buyers and sellers all the way up into uh, the capital markets. We're going to talk about the mortgage market in a second. There's a lot of really interesting work in forest fires and housing. Uh, and we don't really have time to get into this too much, but it really is about proximity. That proximity fades, fades off uh, in terms of the robustness of the effect, uh, usually in fairly coarse increments, in this case, uh, two mile radius, for instance, in some of the cited literature. Uh, strong, there are strong price effects for forest fires, um, uh, and, uh, but they're relatively short-lived unless you're in an urbanized area. There's some selection bias that's been observed in neighboring fires, for instance, uh, particularly if you live in a high risk zone. In fact, just the very publication of fire risk information on a lot by lot basis actually decreases home thistles observed in Colorado. This is a big deal because we're beginning to see more and more risk disclosure mandated, uh, including the state of Texas, which has done some really interesting, well, had some interesting regulation laws passed, including a recent one for renters and the disclosure of prior flooding information. This should uh, have some uh, observable impact somewhere along the way, I would guess. Uh, the publication, uh, oh, well, I'm sorry, the first and second wildfires begin to accrue. Uh, so the more experience you have, obviously, the greater the effect. Uh, you can start to think of these things as disamenities. So it's been observed that um, simply having a view of burned areas, even at a relatively far distance, can have impact on your current value. And two reasons I'm highlighting forest fires. One, the forest fires are changing California, Oregon, high growth states, right? It's changing population decisions, particularly among those who have the wealth and the capacity for uh, just getting up and moving in transcontinental terms, uh, which we are seeing, and I'll come back to that. Um, but also these are, um, I think, important frames for research inquiries that are not necessarily have to do with forest fires, but other hazards, because it's the way people are thinking about it that I think um, is an important uh, way to approach other hazards in evaluating housing uh, and real estate in, in the broader economy of it. Um, but closer proximity, but, 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 as it always is, closer proximity to recreational amenities often overshadows the disamenity, overshadows the disamenities of fire and climate risk. This is something we often see, as you would imagine, uh, in high amenity coastal areas uh, as well, or certain high amenity coastal areas. Um, so these disamenities apply to a wide variety of things, including flash fire risks that uh, increase after forest fires. We're also beginning to see uh, responses in the mortgage market. And I, as you would anticipate, like floods and hurricanes, mortgage default and foreclosure generally tend to increase after a particular event, including a wildfire event. But some of the early evidence is coming particularly out of California is that as we get um, a larger and larger wildfires, we're actually seeing uh, decreasing levels of default, for, uh, default and foreclosures. And part of that um, has been uh, sort of theorized to be coordinated externalities between local governments and insurance companies for rebuilding and that flow of insurance capital. But that really can't continue, particularly at the, um, the uptake in participation and pricing of insurance, um, which is not actuarially based, uh, particularly in California, which um, particularly uh, excludes climate modeling and essentially forcing Idaho and other really people even in Ohio are paying to subsidize uh, essentially climate risk in uh, California. So the mortgage market, so this is all sort of primary housing markets and impact, but what's really happening in the mortgage market? Well, I want to cite here the work of um, uh, Ozad and Khan, who did some very, I think, important um, modeling of looking at the extent to which Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which control these days probably about a little under 60% of the mortgage market, um, the extent to which they're essentially subsidizing risk. Uh, and uh, what they found was that after major hurricane events and disaster events, lenders were ten, tend to force people into what we call uh, conform, conforming loan limits. So they would uh, sort of underwrite properties and force them into a Fannie and Freddie loan and then pass that on and pass on that risk, that default and prepayment risk. Because if you get hit by insurance, you get hit by a storm, you have to pay off uh, your property with insurance, you're prepaying early, you're not getting the full benefit of your interest investment, that's a prepayment risk in its own right. Long story short, they're tending to use these conforming loan limits, pushing homes right up to the value, the maximum value, uh, so that they can participate in the GSE 
uh, lending model and pass on that risk. So I want to talk about uh, what I think is probably the most, uh, uh, well, I think it's the first really published peer-reviewed evidence of a signal on a mortgage market. And this relates to my theory of underwriting, underwater writing or blue lining from the consumer's perspective, it's essentially the same thing. And what we see here, and I don't, we don't have time to get into the broader sort of theoretical constructions, is essentially banks are developing geographies of risk of where to invest and where to disinvest. And they're managing it both extensively and intensively as we have theorized extensively managing it through what they have in their portfolios and what they pass on to the capital markets like Fannie and Freddie and intensively through the changing of terms, shortening the loan term, uh, increased interest rates, for instance, greater risk, greater interest rate. So the problem though, is that their capacity to manage climate analytics and translate that in a competitive market for mortgage underwriting, particularly low interest rates we have in the market we have today, there's a lot of, um, structural and institutional and behavioral limitations that create a misalignment between the actual risk and what they model as that, what they think the risk is, particularly over the life of the term, which by the way, isn't always the actual term on the face of the promissory note. So they're trying to understand long-term to mid-term risk and then execute that in the underwriting of their own, uh, of their own competitive market. And it, there's a misalignment there. Right. And there's a lot of arbitrariness. There's a lot of things that stand in the way of a perfect alignment. That's what you need to know. But our theory here and our empirical sort of conceptualization here was that uh, we have two types of lenders. You have concentrated lenders and non-concentrated lenders. A concentrated lender is a small savings and loan bank, a local bank, a lot of uh, good, strong, soft information about risk. Non-concentrated lenders are Bank of America, Wells Fargo, big national lenders. They may not have a long-standing footprint in a particular community um, through acquisitions. They're, they're big lenders. So you have small lenders and big lenders. Well, our theory was that concentrated lenders have, or uh, concentrated lenders have better soft information. They've been there. People have worked at the bank for 20 years. They know, you know, property may not be in a flood zone, but everybody drives by it every once in a while and they know that it floods on occasion, right? So things like that, uh, we anticipate that they would begin to manage and, and, and internalize climate risk, particularly in coastal air properties, sooner than the, the non-concentrated lenders. Uh, and in fact, during the, uh, the, um, the financial crisis, uh, the Great Recession, uh, as the market bubble was increasing, the concentrated lenders got out like 18 months, 24 months in general, uh, before the big lenders do, because they saw the, the asset values were not commensurate with the underwriting values, right? So we theorize, well, these banks should have better soft information to understand quality, housing quality, but also the underlying risk to the collateral. And long story short is basically what we found is that the, and, and of course there's all different sized banks, regional banks in, in between. So you have to kind of think of this on a continuum of concentrated, uh, to non-concentrated banks. And what we found is that the more concentrated bank you were or your portfolio of lending was, the more likely you were to sell off your mortgages in a sea level rise zone to, uh, to uh, the secondary market and not keep it on the books. We didn't find any uh, differentiation associated with credit underwriting. That is, we anticipated there might be tighter credit uh, for people in higher risk zones, kind of uneven evidence on that. Uh, and I think that'll be something we'll see in, in future years. And in very high risk areas, we did see some credit tightening, but um, I, that's gonna be the inquiry of future research. But it doesn't really matter because what we see quite clearly is that concentrated lenders are getting the risk, the climate risk off their books. Uh, and this is even for the jumbo loans uh, and the jumbo prime loans. Uh, which are important for their own business model on a number of different fronts. So this is problematic because now the market, the capital market is beginning to understand price risk. We already know that in the broader scheme of capital markets from credit underwriting, they're already adding geographic concentration of risk premiums. That is, if you have a bunch of mortgages pooled into an uh, RMBS, residential mortgage backed security, and they're all concentrated in Mississippi or Louisiana or Texas or whatever, there's going to be a risk premium that goes along with that. Um, and that isn't just a macroeconomic risk premium. That's something that has to do with environmental exposure specifically. When you add up the total loan volumes in the secondary market in coastal counties in the United States, which makes up in dollar volumes probably more than half of all the dollar volumes 
uh, of uh, not number, but the dollar value of homes in the United States, a huge percentage of these loans are um, exposed in the one foot sea level rise zone. So we have this enormous concentration of uh, mortgage debt in very, very high risk areas. Um, and that's something we can talk about, um, but nonetheless, it's something that we've essentially socialized the risk in the capital markets utilizing the GSEs. But there's also commercial, I mean, there's life insurance, there's other investors out there, it isn't just the GSEs. So that's all supply, that's all the world's supply, but what about the demand? Well, there's been very interesting survey work recently, and I just wanna highlight, in both academic terms and in the gray literature, I just wanna highlight the work of Redfin, and just fly through a few things here. Uh, in the interest of time, because there's so much to cover here. One in five Americans believes that climate change is already impacting home values. Younger generations are more likely to say that climate change is impacting home values in their area, okay? The awareness, perception, orientation. City dwellers are more likely to say home values in their area are being impacted by climate change. By the way, there's been a lot of work or fair amount of work on perception and various demographics characteristics. People had theorized that, well, if you're you know, more likely to vote Republican than Democrat, you, you're not going to believe in climate, you know, it's going to be misaligned with your belief in climate change, and therefore Democrats are going to discount at a higher rate, etc. None of that plays out. The, the, the only thing that really plays out is the concentration uh, in the survey data associated with beliefs in climate change, and that really cuts across all different types of self-identified ideological spectrum, and really ultimately ends up in the lap of um, degrees and levels of educational attainment more uh, so than anything else. City dwellers are more likely to say that home values and areas are being impacted. 49% of Americans who plan to move in the next year say natural disaster was a factor. I can't believe that this is um, rep a representative uh, number here. Uh, about 12% of the American population moves every year, uh, mostly because of renters moving, their leases running out. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why that number is what it is. Um, I can't imagine that, that, that that's a line. These, these numbers are a line. Um, but if it's even remotely close uh, in terms of a certain segment of the market, this is a pretty scary phenomenon. Younger Americans are more likely to factor climate change into moving decisions. And this includes moving for labor market participation. Three quarters of Americans are hesitant to buy homes in areas with climate risk. Okay, that's hesitant to buy homes in areas with climate risk. Um, 30%, and this is, a, this is a very problematic um, for people who live in Louisiana. I actually live in Philadelphia because my home was largely destroyed by Hurricane Ida. But uh, if you live in New Orleans, this isn't a good sign. 30% of people uh, wouldn't move somewhere with rising sea levels, even if it were more affordable. So more affordable places like New Orleans uh, are, are not going to do so well in that context. So let's switch over now to think about or talk about the ideas of climate migration and managed retreat. And we'll sort of put managed retreat a little bit to a side and recognition that there's some order, orderliness to it in the uh, movement of people and capital uh, and culture, ultimately preservation. There's so much there, so much richness to cover. We tend to think about this in terms of the sending zones and receiving zones. And so in the sending zones, what do we leave behind? What's the trash we leave behind? Who gets left behind? Um, you know, when I say trash, the pollution, the, the literal inundation of our built environment, the, you know, water soluble paints and the toxicity in the environment, there's so much there. It's also the people who get trapped uh, and who fill in to lower value rents, for instance, as we, as we begin to see in high exposure areas, all kinds of challenges there with sending zones. But it's the receiving zones that I'm particularly interested in. And I think there's a little bit of the prompt for some, well, a lot of the prompt for my work and a little bit of the prompt for this invitation. And I think whenever you think about an adaptation or resilience intervention, you have to think about it on, in terms of actual orientation, time horizon, the adaptive and maladaptive implications, um, which are essentially subjective to, to both <laughs> time scale and actual orientation, and the extent to which there may be conflicting and synergistic uh, associations with um, different types of resilience. In this case, we've, I've highlighted ecological resilience, community resilience. So from in the context of receiving zone, that is where people are moving to with climate migration, you can think about resident households. Well, one of their, that, you know, with an adaptation terms, that may be new forms of capital and people and investment and community, essentially. But there's maladaptive implications, certainly with crowding out climate gentrification. 
For the climate migrant household, there's adaptive implications in terms of less exposure and risk, and that may play out in all different types of things we've seen in post-disaster contexts, from life expectancy to education attainment to ill, you know, public health implications, so much there. But there's maladaptive implication in terms of broken social uh, and economic networks and relationships. Um, and there may also be, in terms of, um, let's say, uh, ecological resilience, there may be some amenity value, um, which is one of the attractors to that particular region, but it may also be dealing with things like legacy pollution, certainly an issue for the Midwest. This is drawn from some of my work in Duluth, but just thinking about a city like Duluth or a city like Columbus, you know, on the time horizon of a bond term, a tax assessment, whatever that fiscal orientation may be, it may increase your tax base, but you also have increased welfare burdens and distributional benefit challenges. Um, yes, you want to advance sustainable development, but you also have resource uh, depletion challenges. So there's a lot of different ways that you have to think about this analytically at different scales. So some of my work in recent years is to really kind of change the broader paradigm of Western expansion, which has long been done by humanity scholars, but really, somewhat rhetorically or if entirely rhetorically to think about this as a Northern expansion. Uh, and this is the future of America, I would argue, at least for some component or cohorts of uh, Americans and North Americans to think about Northern expansion. And I'm in fact writing a book right now called North for Oxford University Press. And obviously in areas like Louisiana, you know, people are moving North but climate demography, and this is the work of Matt Hauer, which I've relied on uh, among other environmental demographers for a number of years, you know, are, are telling us some interesting stories about who's leaving. This is just sea level rise risk alone. Extreme heat and forest fires are completely unevaluated, I think, at this point, at least thoroughly. Um, and by the way, one of your next speakers, Professor Shondas, who I, I have is really, first of all, all your subsequent speakers this semester are really uh, fantastic. Uh, but Professor Shandas has really, I think, done some really pioneering, very interesting work that may relate uh, to some of these questions uh, and is worth bringing up. Anyway, climate demography uh, has to be understood. And this broader idea that people are moving uh, because of the various push and pull factors has to be contextualized the Great American Migration Slowdown, which is that people essentially aren't moving as much uh, for debt, dual income, technology, declining incomes, um, mortgage debt, student loan debt, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different reasons. So when you're thinking about, you know, alignment between a place like Columbus and you're thinking about, okay, sending states, labor age mismatch, skills, you know, Florida and South Carolina are sending a lot of elderly and cho uh, children or, or as is anticipated or projected. And in California and New Jersey, for instance, are sending a lot of working age adults, but at, over what time horizon uh, and to what particular receiving location. But thinking about this more formally and structurally in terms of economic development, um, is part of the game that many cities and regions are playing now. So when you're thinking about managed retreat, there's also all of these other more localized considerations about are we helping the right people or people better off after they move? How will sending zones, uh, land use be utilized? Um, you know, and we have to acknowledge the sort of institutional limitations that much of what we do and operate in the forms of managed retreat policy today disadvantages poor people or, or advantages rather people who are homeowners or property rights. We have an existing buyout program in the United States that is where many people sort of begin this analysis, but it turns out there's all kinds of tools that we have and easements and setbacks and uh, you know, beyond property acquisitions, removal of defenses, you know, attraction, it's push and pull. And we have a lot of tools in the toolbox from growth management. Growth management, urban planning has been something that's been set aside because uh, Republican-led state legislators largely gutted it uh, in, in recent generation, really. But I think it's something that's going to come back and be much more relevant as a line of infrastructure planning and economic development in, in a coming generation of urban planning scholarship. Are people better off? Well, a lot of interesting research on this, but some particular research from a few years ago suggests that, well, People are actually moving to areas, they, they can't substitute with the same level of amenity and locational value. So they're essentially moving to poorer places. And in many cases, they're just moving uh, to a, a place with a greater level of environmental risk. So there's some real challenges there. But I, I wanna think that climate migration is broader than forced displacement or buyout programs that kind of localized orientation. That in fact, this is a change, not just of, in, uh, uh, there's agency and intent here on some level. So you can think of a continuum and on one end of the continuum is people 
who do not have the means or the, uh, the, the resources or the skills to be able to be mobile uh, um, and they uh, don't want to rebuild or can't rebuild and they are, it's displacement. It's a kind of classic form of environmental displacement, post-disaster even. And on the other end of the continuum, it's just the opposite. It's people who have the means, the skills, uh, the wealth to be able to get up and move and build a new life and a, a new community somewhere else in this country. And guess what? Particularly with an aging society, the distribution of income where we are, the distribution of age and wealth in very high risk areas, the average median income, median age rather, in uh, like high exposure counties for sea level rise is like, I think it's like 10 or 12 years older than adjacent counties. <laughs> so you start breaking this down, particularly in the context of aging society, uh, we have a unique uh, challenge ahead of us. So I'm interested, not just in the displacement world, because that's where the, the do-gooders and urban planning tend to focus. I'm also very focused and sort of interested in the ideas of elective mobility, people who have the wealth and the means, um, in part because I think they can be, that can drive value capture in a way that can drive sustainable urban development that thinks um, that can accrue and be distributed in broader equitable terms as we understand it in, in, in distributional equity terms. Um, this helps mitigate some of that crowding out challenge. So we did some work a number of years ago in Duluth, Minnesota, as one of many places that we identify that have these sort of perspective qualities and quantities in a way that would be um, amenable to people of elective mobility. And here we tried to align the demographics and the various market segments within those demographics, um, which by the way, in real estate marketing research is unbelievably sophisticated these days in technological terms and being able to identify very, very precise market segments uh, using Nielsen among other things. Uh, and going after and trying to understand what those people want, what are their preferences, what are their desires, even from a design research, understanding the colors and the schemes. There's a, there's a, there's an element here which defies, uh, becomes entirely normative as an exercise of design and sort of defies the principles of uh, well-grounded social science research. But there's something we dived into from a marketing point of view. But we also wanted to think about capacity analysis and the extent to which you know, we have some uh, inbound population. What does that mean at different types of distributions associated with income and skills? What, how does that integrate? And ultimately, what would you do from an advertising or branding or an external engagement and even conversation internally uh, in terms of economic development? This is a very nebulous, fuzzy world of taking some well-defined, robust modes of analysis, uh, if you will, in scholarly terms and really trying to think in very applied terms and very often, I would argue, creative elements. So we developed an entire like set of models to attract different residents all around the country to um, climb immigrants welcome, to project different ideas of the cultural capacity of receiving communities. But we also looked here, this is downtown Duluth, to think about um, somewhat parametrically, um, what would increases in density mean? What are these nodes? How do we develop and double down on ideas of sustainable urbanization? What does that mean in terms of the incremental fiscal capacity and economic capacity, things like impact fees becomes these units of analysis, very simplified, of course, that help us understand you know, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. Again, these are volumetric extrusions. It's not urban design necessarily. It gives us a sense of that concentration, a kind of visualization in a way, um, diagrammatically more than anything, but begins to begin this idea of the vision and what it is that we want to have ultimately, and where do we want to live? So we tested this in social media, and we, we, we got very interesting survey data. Um, and we had these kind of kitsch ideas and mottos and attracted and see what stuck, what worked. It was very interesting. It's something I intend to pursue in uh, more scholarly and creative terms in the coming years. But I want to end, uh, because I want to reserve plenty of time for questions, on some fundamental research questions for, um, let's call it the CMA. Um, if you do have people moving, where and how will they live that advances both climate mitigation and sustainability goals? Uh, what investments can you make today that benefit incumbent residents, even if no climate re uh, climate grants uh, ever show up? Uh, how does the industrial ecology, something like uh, I would understand food and consumer products in your area, and that network of CMA align with high-risk geographies? 
right? How are you connected? What cities and regions does the CMA essentially match with? People in economic development do this work. Uh, and they've done it, I think, somewhat superficially, in part because the regional science, I don't think, is particularly well applied in this regard. But people are starting to think about this. Uh, and I would say more anecdotally than anything, but it's a huge area, I think, for future inquiry. It has a lot of geospatial implications as well, so quite robust for Kira's um, expert capacity. Uh, how do you manage um, uh, climate impacts and environmental resources, right? So how do you align the allocation of resources um, for adaptation and growth management? Again, I think a huge opportunity for growth management. How do you manage climate gentrification and crowding out problems? We've identified that. What are the value capture mechanisms for guiding new sustainable growth? Ohio has a sort of strange and open book when it comes to much uh, value capture mechanisms formally, or at least legally. Uh, how can economic development, regional planning coordinate jobs, housing and transportation? I mean, urban planning 101. Um, what are the mechanisms for coordinating land use infrastructure and adaptation and disaster risk reduction measures? This is a major challenge now currently within the, the current administration at the White House. Um, as we spend all of these uh, infrastructure dollars and climate dollars, how do we begin to have this alignment? What are those indicators? Um, and how's that uh, uh, measure up in terms of accountability and participation from procedural justice point of view and engaging various communities and beneficiaries of these programs, particularly in the context of environmental justice um, and the EJ40 initiative coming from the White House and um, application of benefits. And this is a debatable point, hotly debated point for LMI communities. How does that really work and how does that begin to align in a local sense? Um, and ultimately what I'd leave you with is how does the CMA cultural, that's Columbus metropolitan area, how does it really connect culturally with sending zones? I was mentioning earlier uh, to Professor Miller, you know, the Columbus crew to me is one of the mo most valuable cultural assets you have in connecting with some of these communities on the move. Sounds perhaps crazy, but something I think is underappreciated are the cultural dimensions and the alignment uh, and there are some scholars that begin to work on that. So I'll stop here uh, with these uh, provocations more than anything. And I look forward uh, to um, getting your questions. So thank you very much for the invitation. Perfect, thank you so much. And um, everyone, if you want to uh, enter in your questions in the Q&A box, you can feel free to now. I have a question. The Columbus crew, not the Buckeyes. You don't think that's our, our best export? Cultural well, uh, as a University of Georgia Bulldog uh, and national uh, champions this year, I would like to think that um, it could be a disamenity. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, yeah. So, so I, I have a question. Um, so you painted this picture of like elective climate migration, especially people who are affluent and perhaps in retirement, moving to places like Duluth, perhaps Cleveland, you know, Toledo, places like that. Those places already have a high median age. They also have uh, infrastructure as continuing to age. And this also implies uh, you know, no major tax benefits because yeah. a lot of these people are in retirement. So yeah. what do cities do to prioritize maintenance and infrastructure investment you know, in, in, in this type of situation? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, uh, so Ohio in general has a, um, a huge challenge with unearned income, right? And unearned taxable income. It's a sort of legacy problem, it's many generations in the making, uh, and the tax implications uh, associated with that. Um, I, this is why I bring up the idea of alignment of industrial ecology and age and labor alignments between sending and receiving zones, and being smart about that alignment of how you're attracting and marketing going after particular skills that are going to wedge into your trajectory in the labor market. And, and mm -hmm. people have done this, particularly in healthcare uh, and as well as in technology, even in within, in, within California, people are very smart about this in terms of uh, location analysis. So I think we're gonna, I think what you're gonna see is more intelligence about scaling this up uh, from an economic development point of view, but you've identified a, a fundamental challenge with uh, retirees. The other dimension of this is that healthcare is increasingly an amenity set for uh, relocation and uh, quality healthcare. Uh, mm -hmm. and you see this in Vermont, for instance, in Burlington, Vermont area. Uh, and a lot of college towns, this is a longstanding problem or challenge with college towns. It's, it's, a, it's a driver of the healthcare economy, but at some point in time, you're gonna reach a kind of critical threshold where you have declining marginal utility essentially for bed counts relative to capital investments. So it's a, it's a very complicated healthcare economic problem that I don't fully understand, but I can appreciate 
um, when you begin to hit those thresholds. But you are describing the Eds and Meds economic base model that a lot of these legacy cities in Ohio and elsewhere have adopted so far. Yes. You're thinking that's a good investment for I think up to I think up to, up to a certain point. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 this has been a strategy for 20 years, um, and there's not been a lot of capital investment associated with that because we, our healthcare system has not kept up. I mean, we see this with hospitalization rates with COVID. Our hospital system has not functionally kept up with the bed count that it, it, it commensurate with our, our, the level of care and the duration of care and the relative aging society. So, so it, it can work for a while, but it's mostly rhetoric until at which point you begin to see meaningful, even if you had meaningful health outcomes, I'm not even sure it would be all that well reflected. It's interesting, like healthcare becomes a risk category the same way you begin to capitalize environmental or climate risk. But I'm not mm -hmm. sure that level of transparency in the underlying healthcare economy of it all is necessarily something that is as visceral as climate risk. But it, it does inter interact in a very, in a very complicated way that I can't appreciate. So you do seem to think that cities in this part of the world, which have, which or excuse me, uh, cities and states in this part of the world, which have been depopulating for decades, may see an influx of climate migrants. But if they come here, how they live influences, um, you know, um, ways that can advance, you know. Um, mitigation and sustainability goals. So what are you, yes. what kind of investments should, should cities and regions make in order to, in, to, to accommodate that and accommodate that type of living? Yeah, I, I ultimately, um, there's a long toolbox, a vast toolbox of sustainable urban development. I tend to think this is really about land use more than anything. It's not about product development or housing. And there's things you can do in terms of building codes and technical measures of design and engineering that advance that. And that stuff's pretty well uh, mainstreamed in a way. It, it's ultimately about land use and where you cite this and where you think, and this is why I was referencing growth management because there's so much I think we've lost in 20 years of, of, um, of sort of neutralizing growth management uh, authority and delegation in the United States um, that we've, we've sort of lost that alignment between land use infrastructure and, cap and public capital investment, then that's going to be the most effective mm. way. The supposed most effective mechanisms we're seeing really globally is, is land use. It's something that, of course, has massive political challenges in the context of home rule and in constitutional terms in the United States, but it is nonetheless the most important thing um, you can begin to set up for yourself is, is managing that land use in the long term. Right. And you did mention climate migration happening in places like Miami, um, you know, or excuse me, climate gentrification. Now, of course, legacy cities are uh, heavily polarized. We had a speaker last year, Alan Malik, who talked about that, mm -hmm. about the polarization that's happening in, in legacy cities where some places are gentrifying, other ones, other neighborhoods are free fall, in free fall. Mm -hmm. So uh, could this exacerbate that problem? I mean, could we see a, a feeling yeah. of uh, even greater gentrification these cities yeah yeah i mean this is the crowding out problem it's it's uh it's something that even just as a case study in duluth was a very real problem um some of the most vulnerable they, duluth has a uniquely disproportionate disabled population i think it has to do with the mining the kind of heavy industry there but that they were relatively constant disabled, disabled population and low income population really concentrated in an area that probably had the greatest view corridor and probably had the most opportunity from a development point of view. And they knew that people just intuitively knew that, that, that as the market would heat up and demand would heat up, it would encroach into their neighborhood, which is extremely affordable. People are already struggling. And there's already mm -hmm. a very limited threshold or margin <laughs> from which um, survival rests, uh, given um, relative um, degrees of distribution of income and wage growth, and uh, or just wealth accumulation, and uh, and so you have no margin for error, uh, if you will, and so uh, it's a huge problem. It's a huge challenge, and this is why you have to think about inclusionary zoning and other measures, which. It's not a perfect scenario solution, but it's one of many that begin to think about uh, open the door for value capture and uh, the distributional nature of the development, co-development of affordable and accessible housing. By the way, I want to remind the audience that uh, 
you can enter questions in the Q&A and we'll try to get to them in the last few minutes we have left. Um, I'll, I'll ask one more though, is that, you know, here in uh, Columbus, we face our own climate threats. We face a uh, potential for heat stress and we also face uh, you know, urban flooding from extreme storms. Has there been much research on that? So you talked about sea level rise, you talked about wildfires. Has there been much, much uh, in, uh, research on those two factors and how they're affecting property values uh, on, and, and uh, movement? On uh, river iron flooding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, not really, um, because um, it's hard from an academic point of view, because with wildfires and sea level rise, you have pretty discrete geographies that you're working with uh, in terms of existing sort of boundaries, right? The boundaries are, are well observed for forest fires. As it turns out in fire science, we, we even can measure historic fire patterns. So we begin to overlay things and you create something that looks like even like a sea level rise zone. It's very discrete and it's boundary condition. River iron flooding is much more complicated. There's all different types of flooding, by the way. There's, there's like a dozen different types of flooding. But non-coastal flooding is very complicated uh, um, uh, for a number, just the science is very challenging, but also so are the institutionalized boundaries of and a good example of this is flood zones. So in the national flood insurance programs, we have a 100 year and 500 year flood zones. Many places in the country, these are pretty much, pretty like meaningless, <laughs> worthless designations. They're completely out of date. They're, they're not based on the best available science um, and they no longer reflect the, the true risk uh, dimension. And so uh, it's hard, I think, from an from a observational point of view to get your finger on the extent to which there is a perception of risk in the public. This is why I think what I referenced earlier in Texas is once you get more disclosure laws and more disclosure requirements among homeowners and renters, and there's more of a, we can understand in historical terms if a property has been flooded or an area has been flooded, it has nothing to do with flood insurance, but just as a, as a consumption metric, um, then I think it'll be easier. But the problem is we don't, we can't, look, we can't start from the discrete nature of the risk because it's not quite well known. And in fact, um, extreme precipitation is the most immediate challenge uh, to life and property uh, from climate change, uh, climate attributed extreme precipitation events right now. And the extreme heat's up there, uh, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's a massive, massive immediate challenge. And one, we're not particularly well prepared um, to institutionalize better measures of bounded geography. Okay, uh, Jerrica, I think we have a question from the audience, please. Yep, um, so from the perspective of a resident of a smaller Ohio city or a legacy community, what actionable from uh, this conversation at a local level, if I go to a city council meeting, what do I say or what resources do I bring to the table in order to bring climate change to the conversation without, trigger without triggering um, reactionary beliefs. Excellent question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, I think it, it's about co-benefits ultimately. I think in terms of localized engagement, because this, this is, by the way, this is the same question that chief resilience officers and sustainability officers and mayors ask. It's the same question. <laughs> And I, I think what I would recommend, and this has been a long strategy, both sustainability and adaptation is, and it's a question I raise, which is what can we do today that's going to benefit our incumbent population that will also prepare us for additional population, incoming population, right? So if no climate grants come, and it's not necessarily about peer capacity, but what is it that we are doing for our incumbent population that's going to advance sustainability creation? in a way that um, increases the level of environmental performance, welfare and amenity uh, in our contextual, in our communities. And I think that that um, speaks to a kind of robust idea of community adaptive capacity, which we don't need to necessarily veer into in scholarly terms, but um, it's where you begin. What can you do to, what can you do for the people that are here? Because I think that's going to very, very much resonate with the people um, 
of where you're going. In fact, there's some, there's some emerging research right now that's looking at the kind of level of activation of various communities politically, but also in institutional terms, in terms of sustainability plans, the kind of robustness of how far you're getting into that and the correlation with where people seem to be going uh, certain on the upper end of the climate mobility spectrum. By, by the way, this is all in the field in a couple of different fields, one of them is essentially this kind of hybrid demography sociology world of mobility. And so people are trying to understand the cultural connections and the extent to which political activism or engagement is translating into institutional, at least paper pushing, um, that gives you the kind of veneer that you, you're engaged in climate because people seem to be attuned to that. Uh, and by the way, that in Duluth, that was something that in interviews with lots of people was something they, they were cued in on because they had had 30 years of engagement of investing in environmental technology and science uh, in Duluth, um, because they were trying to move away from that, you know, the state was trying to move away from the iron ore and all, you know, the mining and everything, and try to transition and utilize their tremendous environmental science capacities. And people are tuned into this. This is, I mean, it doesn't rank as high as school districts, but it's something that it's begun to kind of order into the rank preferences. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, we are out of time. I want to thank you very much, Jesse, for a very interesting talk. Um, uh, a lot of rich information there. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, audience, we'll see you on uh, March 4th for Vivek Shandis, March 25th for Robin Lachenko, and April 29th for our panel discussion on the Ohio implications. Please join us. Uh, go to cura.osu.edu to sign up for our newsletter and keep in touch. Take care out there. Thanks again, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Take care, everybody.